All right, we're ready for study two, and uh, next week's studies are right back by the door. So as you, if you didn't pick them up already, make sure you pick those up on your way out. Also get those online. Welcome those of you at home, Judy <laughs> and Lowell. And uh, remind everybody that we're recording all this so that it'll be posted later for those that, that can't be here or can't be on here live. And um, Last week we tested all the equipment, had a nice microphone. Seemed like I picked up everybody. I left the microphone at home. So uh, I might have to repeat stuff this week so that they get on the recording, but uh, hopefully bring the equipment next week. We're going to study two. We're going to look at Psalm 90 tonight, and we're going to talk about the uh, historical context, and that's really, you know, the, the difference in this psalm study to maybe some other studies in the psalms that you've done before. I've never done the psalms like this before, so we're, we're all on, most of us, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody's told me they've done this before, but in some uncharted territory. Uh, but it makes sense because we talk a lot about looking at the scripture in the uh, historical context. And so this helps us to put these psalms in a reasonable historical context. And I say reasonable because some of them we know precisely because there's a, a title ascribed to it that gives us a point in the Old Testament text where that psalm sprung from. Um, but some of them, uh, it's, it's more uh, general. Uh, but I think uh, what we've collected and, and the resources used to get this together gives us a pretty good idea of what the historical background uh, and some of the specific events might be that take place. Now, this one tonight, we have a real good sense of the history, uh, and, and I won't talk too much, otherwise I'll answer the questions before we get to them. <laughs> uh, and I want you guys to jump in and answer the questions uh, and, and talk and, and input as much as you want. Same for you folks at home. Make sure you unmute yourself if you have a question or comment as we go along the way. So with all that said, uh, let's uh, take a look at Psalm 90. And before we get into talking about the history, let's we're going to do each week uh, the same opening questions, and that is, what's the classification or type of psalm? Uh, if you don't have the insight on that, make sure you pick up the intro to the psalms packet. Uh, if you don't have one, just let me know uh, the author, and then any special instructions that the psalm might include in its opening title. So what kind of, how would you classify this psalm? What kind of psalm is this? There was just about everything that we had categorized. There was praise, there was national lament, specifically praise and warn. There was thanksgiving in verses 14 through 16, which Romans in 2 and 3. There was petition in 16, 17, and there was a lot of wisdom in some of those throughout. Hey, good. Kind of into everything. Yeah, and, and that's, yeah, that's the wrong one. Huh? Uh, so, right. That was one of the things that entered in my mind too. That when I went over and read the definition for petition, it says prayer for God to deliver judgment on his enemies. Uh, a petition, does it ha specifically have to be that? No, it doesn't. A petition, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah, and you've got differing. Um, Sorry, even though Andy took this over, I wasn't ready. So, um, differing definitions on what those different things mean. Imprecatory and petition are all types of prayer. Uh, they're both types of different types of prayer, but they're. It's like a lot of things that we talk about in Scripture. They're they're so closely linked. They're depending on who you talk to. One may use them interchangeably. One may have a little more uh, specialized meaning. But imprecatory just basically just means to plead. Um, so it, it, so it's a lot like petition. Uh, so it's again, the same thing, but prayer in and of itself is, it can be a pleading. Uh, and so it, you know, I don't want you to get too tight. To these are, these are, these classifications, um, are more for your benefit and how you, you see it as you read the Psalm at the time, there are going to be some things that are pretty 
hard and fast. It's going it is clearly a praise song, but does it have Thanksgiving in it? Absolutely. Does it have petition or prayer in it? Yes. Jay said it has wisdom. Does it have wisdom? Well, every one of the Psalms is going to have wisdom because they're all, uh, they're all part of God's word. So it, um, this is a, a good example of me to me of how there is the old saying, there's one proper interpretation for scripture, but there are a multitude of applications to scripture. And these classifications are really more application than they are interpretation. Uh, because that's one of the, the great things about all of God's word. We sometimes uh, uh, characterize it as a, as a, a gem or a diamond that catches the light differently how you turn it. You see different colors or different shades of light or prism, whatever you, you know, whatever helps you understand that, depending on how you turn it. And so you might read Psalm 90 this time, and what really comes through to you is the praise. But you might read it a year from now, because you're, you talked about this before, your situation in life changes, you're laying in a hospital bed, falling into walls, whatever it might be. And uh, you, might, you might see it as a, as a petition, or you might see it as a Thanksgiving, because you're still, um, you know, you're still amongst the living. And, and so there's, uh, uh, again, don't get too tied to them. And if I have my answers up here, oh, I got the wrong answer. It's not that at all. In most of these Psalms, you really, it, with maybe the exception of Messianic, you, most of these Psalms can have hints of everything in them. Uh, all those different classifications, depending on how, how close you're reading, just where you're at in life. So anybody else? Okay. Good. Yeah, and there is lament in this as well, and and that's again the case with uh, with with a lot of these psalms. They they defy uh, singular classification, and I think there there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I can't remember what. Would, anyway, no, no, I won't get into that. Somebody was talking about listening to a piece of music, and one person it made them I mean, a classical piece of music. It made them, you know, immensely. It made them happy. The other person says, how can it make you happy? It's a sad piece of music. And, and it's, it's like that with some places in scripture too. It can, it can strike you one way. It can make you burst out in praise, but it can cause you to lament or bring back a, a memory or an occasion in your life uh, that's a lament. So, uh, and that's fine. Anyone else? Recognizes God in His sovereignty. Uh -huh. Down to the 16, 17, 17, let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us. And He's going to bless the work of our hands. Uh, only God can do that. Good. Yeah, and, and even early in the sun, before the mountains were brought forth, forever you had formed the earth. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So there are aspects of, of enthronement and declaring specifically the sovereignty of God. And we're going to see that as we talk about some of the things that, uh, that Moses points out about the character and nature of God. What about uh, any special instructions in this psalm? Not any here. Uh, but we do have a line here. What does it tell us? What's the opening line or the, the uh, caption, if you will, tell us? Okay. Just below that, do you have a do you have anything else to say? A prayer? Yeah. Yeah, those are in the text. And now whether they go back to the original or whether they were added there by say Ezra, who we think was probably responsible for compiling the Psalms, uh, we don't know, but they carry on into the uh, into uh, the the, uh, the Hebrew uh, and and are carried on into the translations of the Hebrew into Greek and Latin later. So uh, that's important because if if they're there as part of the text, even if they're added later by someone like Ezra, it's still the the uh, Holy Spirit guiding these men along to give us some 
uh, either historical references, or in this case, tells us very clearly who the author is. So on that third question every week, are there any special instructions? And that second question, note the author, that's where you're going to find it. If the author is noted, that's where it's at. Uh, in the Psalms, we're tempted, and I'd still do this, uh, to say, well, David said in, in this Psalm, and, and lo and behold, go back, and it does, never says David wrote it. We just make an assumption that David wrote uh, a lot of the Psalms that he didn't necessarily write. He did, as we talked about last week, write the majority of the Psalms. But the one I'm most guilty of, is, well, the two I'm most guilty of, is Psalm 1 and Psalm 119. And there's not any clarity that David actually wrote those psalms. Um, could he have? Absolutely. But uh, Psalm 1, we're not going to look at until way at the end, because at, just through the course of this study, I probably lean more heavily now towards uh, Ezra writing it uh, as kind of an introduction to the psalms, or Ezra discovering it amongst all these psalms and, and putting it in there. Uh, and it's it's not one of those things that you get in a knockdown drag out over. If you always regarded Psalm 1 as being written by David, that's fine. Ultimately, they're written by the Holy Spirit, and that's what's really important. So watch for those, those little title statements. Sometimes they give us some musical direction. Uh, sometimes it gives us the author. Sometimes it tells us an historical connection. So watch for those things as we go along. All right. Uh, the 90th Psalm, uh, as we said, it could have been written by Moses. Um, and what we, what, what we don't know, and I didn't ask this question in any of the Psalms, uh, part of what we'll be looking at in the historical context will hopefully help answer uh, these things. But uh, there we go. Um, but when was it written? Now, in Moses, we have his entire life. Now, not day by day, but we have literally from his birth to his death in scripture. And we don't have that with every character in scripture. But Moses, we do. So at what time in Moses's life did he write this? Let's see if we can narrow it down as we go to that first question uh, about the, the history of Israel's situation from Exodus to Deuteronomy. What part of Moses's life do you think we could shrink that down to? How old was Moses when he when he died, anybody remember? 120 years old. So Moses' life, if you're not aware, can be chunked up in the, in the sections of 40. He was in Egypt for 40 years. He left Egypt for 40 years. And then he took the children of Israel out of Egypt for 40 years. So he spent 40 in Egypt, 80 outside of Egypt. It's a classic reminder that if you get to the point where you're 80 years old and you think God's done with you, uh, for Moses, some of the most difficult days were ahead because he had 40 years to deal with the children of Israel in the wilderness. So don't, don't give up uh, when you turn 80. Don't give up when you turn 40 uh, because Moses, uh, that's when God really started developing his character uh, when he was 40 years old and those, those 40 years in between. And you think about that, 40, from 40 to 80, um, Moses, you know, goes and, and and gets married and works for his father-in-law and works as a shepherd and does all kinds of things and probably is, is putting money away in his 401k and everything, thinking he's going to retire. And God calls him back into some serious service uh, and not, you know, from working from home. <laughs> he had to hoof it for 40 years from 80 to 120 years old. And uh, I think that's... Uh, I'll just sum up, you know, I don't think there's too many guys. Oh, okay. It says my screen sharing is plus. Thank you. Probably when I. It's probably when I resized it and it messed up. So we'll just leave it like here, like this. I think that's the other one. That is the other one. Ian, Ian, I'm glad you're here. Are you sure you want to go out of town? That's <laughs> okay. Go ahead and talk while I see if I can. know that God took Moses uh, because would not allow him to go into Canaan with the rest of the right. Israelites. Uh, but if you look in Deuteronomy in, the, in that last chapter, 
it says that in verse 7, although Moses was 120 years old when he died, his eye was not dim, nor his vigor abated. That's right. So had the Lord decided, you know, made the decision to take him then for the reason why he took him. Right. Uh, he made the live a long time. 40 more years. 40 yeah. more years. So, and, and Marty's exactly right. Um, so given those, those chunks of 40, when do you think this was probably written? What, what section of his life? Okay. The last 40. And then within that 40 years, given what you looked at in Deuteronomy, let's talk about the history, uh, and what, what things were going on in the historical backdrop. And during that 40 years, when might Moses have written this song? I know I didn't ask that question, so if, no, if you don't have an answer, that's all right. Okay, probably at the very end. It could have been written at any time because it's not recorded, even though we've got a couple other songs of Moses that were written at the end. Um, that, that fact alone has some people believe in it. This one was written earlier, like right after they crossed the Red Sea, but we don't know for sure. And, and, you know, I think ultimately it doesn't matter. I know we talked about that a lot in the, in the uh, survey of the Bible, uh, you know, not to get too hung up on when something was written unless uh, it really disrupts the biblical timeline. Here, it doesn't. Somewhere in the last 40 years of Moses' ministry, uh, he, he uh, has this song of praise. So let's talk about the context. What did you learn from reading uh, in Deuteronomy uh, yeah, or I guess that's the next question. Before we get to that, what's kind of the general situation of Israel from Exodus to Deuteronomy? Mm -hmm. in a way. Okay, in some ways, there, there are some aspects of it that are dysfunctional, at least. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Murmuring mob. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, God supported the Israelites in Egypt during that time. He brought them out safely to the land of Moab, which is the beginning of Deuteronomy. Supported them in the wilderness, land east of the Jordan. Provided clothes, shoes, and, and manna from heaven. And then the territory west of the Jordan River. Okay, good. That's a really good brief overview, and that's, that's kind of what I, everything you guys said before was absolutely right. But I wanted to take us all the way back to the beginning of Exodus, and Exodus, you know, uh, comes in at the end of about a 400-year period where they were left between Genesis and Exodus um, with uh, uh, Jacob, Israel, dying and leaving the children of Israel there in Egypt, rather than them going back and Joseph sending them back to their, their homes, or sending them back to the homeland, they stayed there. And uh, God used that uh, to preserve them and to grow them. Um, and we could talk about whether they should have gone back or whether they shouldn't have, but certainly they didn't, so it doesn't matter. We can't what if about it. God, uh, they, they stayed in Egypt and they became a great people. They became uh, an overwhelming people, uh, so much so that the Egyptians felt they, need, they needed to uh, get them under control, and they put them in bondage and in slavery. So, uh, you know, Exodus opens up, and even though, you know, the old Ten Commandments movie uh, spends all this time on uh, what happened there, we really only have two chapters that really deal with Moses's early life, and then it gets right into uh, getting to uh, the, the, the middle part and the end part of his life. And so Exodus is really focused on getting the uh, Jews out of Egypt and pre prepping, prepping them to get them out of Egypt, uh, and then getting them out of Egypt and delivering them from Egypt uh, under the, the leadership of God, uh, using Moses as his human leader. So uh, Exodus gives us that. Then we get into Leviticus, Numbers, uh, Leviticus and Numbers uh, that really encodes the law and gives us a, a lot of the details of the law. Leviticus really obs uh, I say obsessed, but uh, uh, anyway, 
details all the Levitical law, uh, numbers a little more of the history, and then Deuteronomy is just, uh, just is about a few months um, of history uh, just before they go into the promised land. Uh, but in that interim, that say you said the murmuring, murmuring mob, the murmuring mob, that's kind of what they became. And uh, why, why, why did Ed use that terminology? What did they do after they came out of Egypt? They about everything. Okay, they cried about everything from the very beginning. And why is that such a, uh, why is that so problematic? I mean, griping and grumbling uh, in and of itself is problematic for any people called by God. But why for them? Why should they not have been griping and grumbling? What kinds of things had they seen? <laughs> well, you, you would think so. You know, on paper, uh, certainly they were. But uh, at some point, they didn't feel like they were. You're exactly right. They were free. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. They, you know, you just think before they even got out to the, the desert, which is what caused a lot of their grumbling, uh, how much they had seen before they even left and on their way out of town. I mean, God had, had, had shown the, through the series of plagues on Egypt, uh, his power. And it wasn't, these weren't some private signs. We talked in God, the gospel of John, that first sign of, of Jesus as he changes the water to wine is sometimes characterized as kind of a private sign because uh, only uh, Jesus and Mary and the, the five disciples and then the servants who filled the water pots were the only ones that knew what was going on. Everybody else didn't know where the wine came from and didn't know why it was the, the best was saved for last and so forth. But these weren't private signs. These affected everybody. Uh, it, they affected the Jews favorably. They affected the Egyptians unfavorably. Uh, they resulted in the Egyptians causing the Jewish slaves to do harder bondage, harder work, uh, made, it, made their task more difficult. And so they saw those things. And on top of that, uh, what happened as they were leaving town? Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're paying them to go, you know, take, take these gold earrings and take this necklace. And, and they take all these, all these articles of gold that uh, they don't steal them, they're, they're giving them to them. And not only that, but they go out and they, they see the Red Sea parted. And you know we won't spend time on that. We had talked a little bit about it in Survey of the Bible, but uh, it, was, it was a legitimate event. It was not you know, a, a ripple across a little uh, uh, bayou or something. This was a this was wall of water on either side uh, to the extent that, how do we know that? Okay, God says, but just using the data that God gives us, how can we be assured of that? Yeah, there were armies drowned. I mean, the armies of the Egyptians were destroyed, and as part of these Psalms of Moses that we have this week uh, recounts that in Deuteronomy, uh, that certainly, and I've heard people argue, well, it would have been a greater miracle if it was just like six inches of water and God drowned the armies of well, okay, <laughs> so let's discount one miracle to, that's clearer in Scripture. We're going to take it literal that they're walking between these walls of water uh, in, in great fear whether to even go in. If it was six inches of water, they wouldn't have been in fear to go in, but uh, we get a little ridiculous in the arguments we make. But uh, So they saw that, and then uh, they're delivered from these armies, and so they see a lot before they even get into the wilderness. And what causes them to begin grumbling right away? You might recall. I know this was more reading than just the, uh, the few chapters I gave you, but uh, we're going to test your Bible knowledge tonight. <laughs> okay, uh, no food. Immediately what happens is Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the law, and he's gone. Yeah, he's gone for 40 days. And... And so Moses disappears, and they think, who knows what? I'm sure many of them thought, well, Moses has abandoned us. Or, you know, Moses is 80 years old. He probably, probably, you know, broke his hip somewhere, and he's dead. 
Uh, and, and so they immediately begin to question uh, not the leadership of Moses. They may ascribe it to Moses, but they're ultimately questioning the leadership of God. And uh, it, 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 of course, doesn't, doesn't pan out well for them. Let's, uh, let's get them to Deuteronomy here. So why did they end up from the end of Exodus, where they come out of Egypt, to the end of Deuteronomy, uh, almost 40 years passed. Why is that? They were supposed to go on to the promised land. Why? What happened that, that they were 40 years? I mean, we talked about they grumbled, but what did God say the penalty for all that grumbling was? Yeah, the, he says, and you know, the, the author of Hebrews, God, what he writes in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament is, uh, it, it's it's, it's eloquent and it's graphic. He says, their corpses fell in the wilderness because God had said, you will not enter my rest. And so the penalty was not for grumbling or murmuring directly. It was for uh, unbelief. It was for the lack of faith. It, it was because they had disbelieved God, disbelieved God's messenger uh, or messengers through both Moses and Aaron and uh, it resulted in them being denied entrance into the promised land. So God, instead of just, and God could have done this, wiped them out on the spot and took whatever remnant was, had already been born in the wilderness and take them, or as God offered to do to Moses, let me raise up uh, children from you and, and fulfill the promise. Um, God had them go out and wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Um, and why did he do that? Why, why didn't he just, because he did some of them. Ground opened up and swallowed some of them up. Okay, yeah, and that's an important point. Um, and it's the reason I want to ask, because somebody asked me this week, so did none of the, the Jews uh, of that generation go to heaven? And there's no reason to believe that they didn't go to heaven, but they didn't get to go into the promised land on earth. It, it, it actually, it, it's like what we're seeing in, in the uh, Gospel of John. It's actually an act of God's both judgment and grace at the same time. Because if he had taken them out immediately, that was it. They, they died in unbelief. They had an opportunity to do two things in those 40 years. They had the opportunity to express genuine faith in God, but they also had the opportunity to be part of bringing up a new generation and hopefully bringing them up in faith. And, and I, I think we can even eliminate hopefully because whether it was from the result of those parents or uh, the result of Moses and Aaron's leadership, they were faithful because they were willing to go into the promised land. They were, as a matter of fact, we, we, when we looked at uh, Joshua, uh, the book of Joshua and survey of the Bible, there was an excitement by a generation who didn't even see all those miracles that their, that their parents had seen about going in and claiming the land that God had promised to give them. Uh, and it's a, it's a real contrast between a, an unbelieving generation and a believing generation. All right, so Deuteronomy 29 to 34, what does that bring us to? What did you find as you read uh, those few chapters in Deuteronomy? And why are they significant? Okay. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. All right. Anybody else want to add to that? What things happened there in 29 to 34? Okay. The community, the community consisted of those children and even strangers that had joined the Israelites, and even those yet to be born. Okay, good. Uh, Jack said, if you didn't hear him, he says to bind together. Uh, I didn't exactly what you said, but some of the effect to bind together God and the people. The the the, the covenant is uh, is revisited, and this is the covenant between God and Abraham specifically 
And it's renewing that covenant that they'd been instructed with. You've got a generation that the entire generation is, is under 40 years old, except for a very few. Joshua and Caleb obviously are, are older um, and are going to take the people into the land. But the majority of the generation is under 40 years old. Um, and they uh, have been tutored in the covenant and in the law now for 40 years. Uh, and this is the formal uh, re, uh, renewal, uh, reaffirmation, if you will, of that covenant, which is now, you know, almost 600 years old. You got to go all the way back to that whole time of, of slavery in, in Egypt uh, and back past uh, mo closer to 700 years old. Uh, I have to do the math, but all through the life of, of Jacob, all through the life of Isaac, and then back to, to uh, Abraham. And so it's, you know, longer than our nation has been formally in existence. Uh, they're reaching back to be renewed and reminded of a covenant that God had made. And what a, what a statement that is, and what, a, what an exercise this is on God's part because it affirms for us even today that God always keeps his promises. He always fulfills his covenants. 600 years, doesn't matter. 2,000 years, doesn't matter. 5,000 years, doesn't matter. God's going to keep his, his promises and his covenant. So it ratifies again that covenant for this generation that they can personalize it, just like we can take the word of God and personalize it today. It wasn't just written for the Ephesians 2,000 years ago. It's written for us this covenant for the nation of Israel was written for Israelites. Jack said, even those that hadn't been born yet, it's, it's an extension of that covenant to those that, that are still yet to be born. Uh, in, when they get in the new land, uh, those next generations, it, it's still, uh, it's, still uh, it's ratified for them as well. Spit it out there, Jim. All right, anybody else? What else happens here? There was some. You know, there, there was some to that. And, uh, but he also uh, gave Moses uh, hope. Yes. You know that uh, he would take care of the children of Israel, restore the nation. And, and this is a really good point because it's still applicable for us today. Uh, Marty said he gave Moses hope that he, God, would restore the people. The hope is always in God. It's got to be in the sovereign God to do that work because man's always going to fail. So when we go and look at our charter as believers, the New Testament, if you will, and it's, it's all of God's word, but let's look at the New Testament as the church. What does Paul say to both the Thessalonians and to Timothy? Well, eventually the church is going to fall away. Uh, eventually they're going to come to the place in, in 2 Timothy 4 where they're going to have itching ears. That's not talking about unbelievers. He's, he's talking there. He's addressing about what the state of the church is going to be. They're going to gather together uh, people in accordance with their own beliefs, uh, teachers in accordance with their own beliefs. Uh, in, in 2 Thessalonians, he says that the Antichrist come until the, can't come until the falling away occurs first. That's not talking about the world. That's talking about Christianity or those that call themselves believers are going to fall away and, and walk away from the faith. And, and so when you look at that, you see an amazing consistency, unfortunately, in the heart of God's people. God says to Moses, you know, unfortunately, the Jews are going to, they're going to disbelieve me. They're going to be faithless again. Uh, and, uh, but I'm going to be faithful to them. And God says the same thing about the church. Eventually, the church is going to become faithless. But I'm going to be faithful to those that, that have a place of faith in my son. And so uh, it, it's, it, it's those similarities sometimes that cause replacement theology where they're saying, well, God's just talking in the New Testament about he's taken Israel and replaced it with the church. That's not what he's saying at all. He's just saying there's a consistency in the hearts of man. Uh, and unfortunately, we, we, we become faithless um, as a group. Individually, we have the great capacity, and as small groups, a great capacity to, to remain faithful and see the faithfulness of God, if we care to, to look. 
Good. Uh, anyone else? Sure. Yeah. Tell me specifically what. Yes. And the fact that it's not only the word, but it's the commitment of love that the church has to one another. Very good. Yeah, our, the church is supposed to be declaratory I mean, with, with our actions, with our words, uh, with our attitudes, with our love. Uh, is supposed to be declaratory, and, and so that the world sees that there is something different. Uh, and the nation of Israel had the same mandate, by the way. Uh, and almost immediately, they began to drop the ball because they go into the land and were tolerant of those that they were supposed to drive out and struck deals with those they were supposed to drive out. And for the short term, it worked out fine, but in the long term, well, those very people they struck deals with ended up becoming real thorns in their side. And what do we find? Oh, church, we do the same thing. Well, you know, we've got to make friends with different aspects of the culture in order to reach the culture. And God says, no, just be distinct. Uh, not, not be nasty or be judgmental or be mean. Just be distinct. Be distinct in uh, what I've made you and what I've made you to be. Well, a couple of other things that, that he points out in, before we get on to the, the rest of the questions tonight is that one of the things I love about what God does here, and he does it throughout Scripture, particularly in the, in the Old Testament, we also see it uh, to some degree in the New Testament, is he, he, puts, he, he commissions leaders. Um, so it wasn't, you know, Moses is going to go die, and you guys go choose your own leader. He, he commissioned Joshua uh, to take them into the land. And, uh, and, and even as we go on, we find when God, when they, when they don't look to God to commission a leader, what happens? Well, Joshua is followed by the book of Judges. And what happens in the book of Judges? It repeatedly states for us, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so God raises up Judges and then he ultimately raises up Samuel. And they reject Samuel. And, of course, Samuel's heartbroken that he's rejecting. It's like, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And, and they wanted to be like the nations. But here, uh, God commissions Joshua uh, and uh, allows Joshua to lead them into the land. So that kind of sets the stage. And we have a couple of other songs of Moses uh, that are in the additional uh, psalm survey this week that if we if we have time uh if you have questions or comments about we talk about but this one is uh is recorded for us in the psalms itself and most likely because it wasn't recorded in the pentateuch as uh, per perhaps as ezra or who maybe solomon even Perhaps David, as they come across these, these writings of Moses, or if it's an oral tradition that's passed down, lo and behold, it's not included anywhere else. The Holy Spirit moves them to include it here in the book of Psalms. And uh, it, it does some important things about evaluating the character and nature of man as well as evaluating the character and nature of God. So let's talk about Psalm 90. Uh, and if you've got your Bible, hopefully you're open there. And because I've talked too much, I don't know if we'll read the whole thing, but we'll, we'll read uh, portions of it, particularly as you have opportunity to comment on it. Go ahead and read the portion you're commenting on it. But what does Moses note about the character and nature of man in Psalm 90? What are some things you saw about what he says about man himself? Okay. <clears throat> he points out that Okay. Yeah, there's a there's some uh, uh, suggestion of the arrogance of man, just because we don't we don't esteem our proper place and our proper understanding of what James will say later in in uh, in the New Testament that life is just a vapor. And Moses visits some of those, those themes here that uh, uh, man, we're like, uh, our days are like a sleep. 
uh, in the morning they're like grass in verse five, which grows up in the morning it flourishes and grows up in the evening it is cut down and it withers. Uh, so our, our, our life is pretty short and that's not intended to depress us. What's it intended to do? Exactly. Very good. Yeah, to teach us to number our days, or as uh, the New Testament says, to redeem the time because the days are evil. So it's it, it's to put our life, uh, even though our days sometimes seem long to us, uh, and that really in the in the scope of things are short, and to make uh, the best use of the time that God has given us to to His glory and to, to number our days and use them wisely. Good. What else does he say about man? Okay. He, he talks about the fact that we're ripe for judgment. And uh, he, he tells us that our iniquities are, are right out before the eyes of God. Verse 8, you have set our iniquity, our sin, before you. You want a, a verse that will uh, make you shake in your boots. Our secret sins in the light of your countenance. Uh, and we should be reminded and remind ourselves, be reminded by God's word and God's spirit that there's nothing hidden from God. There's not a thing that's hidden. And we, we think we're masters at, at hiding things or uh, keeping things a secret, and there's not a thing that, uh, that's secret. We just looked at uh, Hebrews 4, uh, 4.12 uh, a few weeks ago in Sunday school and was reminded that of the power and precision of the word of God that that divides the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It's all made, uh, laid naked and made bare before him who, whom we have to do with. Uh, and, and that's exactly what he's saying here. It's a reminder that, uh, that, our, that our actions and attitudes, whether sinful or righteous, are laid out before God. All right, good. Anyone else? Side, which I thought that was, that was kind of, oh wow, <laughs> <me>. right on. <laughs> but after the days of our life, they contain 70 years or a few strange occasions. Yeah. You know, our purpose is perfect for what we have numbers. I kind of wonder if uh, Moses. If he did write this right after the Red Sea, he's about 80 years old, and he's thinking, oh, I'm at the end of my life. <laughs> I have to worry about this much longer. Um, I, I thought my wife made a really good observation. She said, you know, for a man that supposedly had so much trouble speaking, he's pretty eloquent in writing and, and in praying. And I think that was a good, a, a good observation. Go ahead, Steve. Moses is writing this if he was, you know, God is still in Okay. Yeah, that's one of the things we didn't talk about, kind of for time's sake, but yeah, Moses doesn't get to go in. He gets to look at it uh, from Mount Nebo, um, but uh, he doesn't go in, and, and not for, I mean, you think about the Jews and the, the kind of doubt and uh, grumbling and complaint, complaint they had. Moses, from what we can glean, one act, and God says no. Uh, and that's, it's a really important um, fact about the life of Moses, and you can connect it, again, to the book of James, James 3. Don't let many of you be teachers, knowing that you will incur a stricter judgment. And God illustrates that with someone like Moses, that Moses, you're in this position of, of leadership. Uh, you are the, the, uh, the emblem of faith, if you will, and for you to you know, be faithless at one time or be disobedient at one time uh, speaks loud enough that it carries a heavier consequence. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a neat little study just in itself. Uh, it's a sobering study in and of itself uh, as far as our own positions as either fathers or grandfathers, teachers, preachers, what have you, that uh, our actions can have uh, 
great ramifications and can carry some sobering consequences too. Okay, what about the character and nature of God? Some of them uh, have been mentioned already. The sovereignty of God is certainly declared here. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. And that's such an important uh, two verses concerning the eternality of God. But it's also where we don't connect it oftentimes is since Scripture is declarative that Jesus Christ is God and that the Holy Spirit is fully God, anything we pick up here in the Old Testament or in the New Testament that declares an attribute of God, it is ascribed as well to the Son and to the Spirit. And so it, Christ is eternal. He, everything that says here about God is, is ascribed to Christ and it's ascribed to the Holy Spirit as well. What else do you see about the character and nature of God in this song? Well, verse 4 talks about his our time meaning nothing. nothing. How, how we view sight. Yeah. For a thousand years in your sight are but a yesterday when it is past or as a watch in the night. So the way, I mean, to us, I mean, we lose a day or a two in the week and we're losing our mind. Yeah. <laughs> that's right and, and that's a it's a well worth pointing out that while god affirms not just here but both in the elsewhere in the new old testament as well as in the new testament that time is is a is a non-issue with him it doesn't mean he devalues time because in this same psalm has already been pointed out he says teach us to number our days so though god's not bound by time and God's not worried about, you know, making the schedule or, or putting in you know, 40 hours or anything like that. Um, he has bound us in time or given us time. Uh, and uh, and he, he expects us to be uh, good stewards uh, of the time he gives us. And stewardship of time is every bit important in, every bit as important in scripture as stewardship of money. And we put a lot of emphasis on stewardship of resources, but stewardship of time in scripture is a pretty uh, consistent, there's a pretty consistent message about that, uh, that is easy to overlook. Uh, and, and it doesn't mean we can't enjoy ourselves or anything like that. Scripture makes clear we, we can enjoy our days, enjoy a meal, enjoy things, enjoy your family. But we, it's one of the resources God's given us that we, we, we're going to give an account for as well. So to keep it in that perspective. What else? Merciful. merciful. Yeah, the mercy of God is, we're going to see all through the Psalms. And even in this one, as was pointed out here, our, our iniquities are set before us, but they're put there in contrast of God's mercy. Return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants and satisfy us early with your mercy. Uh, and, and God just never runs out of mercy. Uh, isn't that amazing? That's exactly right. Yeah, the, it's not one or the other. And we paint these pictures of God or have them in our own view. I got, I'll, I'll say sometimes we, we get this picture of God like he's Zeus just waiting to throw down lightning bolts on us. Uh, God can be both... Uh, demonstrate his wrath or his judgment, but also demonstrate his mercy at the same time. They're not either or. Uh, and we see it with Moses. I mean, with Moses is, is, is an example of he's judged. Uh, he doesn't get going to the land, but that doesn't mean God is no longer merciful to Moses. He, he continued to sustain him. Uh, God was wrathful, was ju judged the people of Israel, but he was merciful in that he uh, kept them alive. We kind of mentioned in passing, Jack mentioned that God provided food and shoes and things for him. Uh, there was a miracle there in and of itself. The shoes and the clothes that they wore never wore out. Now, knowing the hearts of man, that wasn't a miracle to them. They said, when are we going to get some new shoes? I'm tired of wearing the same shoes. I'm tired of wearing the same clothes every day. 
and, and look right past the miracles. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> look right past. Would you get work on that back there, Dennis? Get some tires made out of that uh, God material. <laughs> So, so mercy, absolutely. All right, one more. Anybody have one more? What's the significance of the phrase there, Sabbath by early the Sabbath? Yeah, why, anybody have a, a thought on that? Okay. Yeah, I would connect it to forward in Scripture, which is really not new later on. It's again, the consistent nature of God, but we see what's called progressive revelation, where we see different things that are highlighted as we go through scripture about any doctrine, and in this case, the nature of God. And what is, I mentioned this Sunday morning, what does Lamentations 3 tell us? Your, your mercies are new every morning. And so I think it has, it can have a couple of applications. One is that God's mercy is consistent and that we can revisit every day, every, every morning, his mercies are new. Every time we wake up and see the sun, that's God's new mercies. Again, we look past the miracle of that and say, eh, another sunrise. Oh, it's kind of cloudy today. Uh, they're talking on the weather tonight. Oh, yeah, the smoke from California is kind of, you know, causing a haze here in Missouri. And eh, God's mercies are new every day. Um, but also, we can, we can make the application from our perspective. And... The, whether God, whether we're going to appreciate the mercies of God is, is determined in part by whether we're going to actively do the things that we need to do, whether we're going to do Romans 12, 1 and 2. We're going to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. If not, uh, or if we, we begin the day or we begin day after day without thanksgiving or without acknowledging God, then we rob ourselves. And, and, and the, the, the kind of the uh, absurdity of it is we've come back and say, well, God, why'd you let this happen to me? And most of the time it's because we've robbed ourselves of mercy, or we looked at in Jude Sunday night, mercy and peace and love. God gives them an, an unlimited supply. But if we don't, if we don't draw and if we don't take advantage of it, then we don't have it. So I think uh, there's a couple meanings with early. Uh, one is God's, perspective, and that's it's always available, even early in the day or early in our life. But uh, for us, how many times do we start out on our own and have to, uh, you know, hit a wall to realize I need to call out to God uh, and take, take advantage of his mercy or take advantage of his, his, his patience or what have you? Sometimes we've got to remember that everything that God does for us is done out of righteousness. We try to apply, we forget and try to apply our human emotions. There's a lot of our, a lot of things that we do toward people that we don't like or for people that have hurt us and what have you is done out of right. anger and hatred. But God, everything God hands down is done out of righteousness. And love. Right. And the next verse kind of addresses that because it says, Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us. And there's that judgment and mercy going hand in hand. Uh, it, it's, it's getting a handle on what God's doing or allowing in our life to understand that his, his mercy hasn't been vacated in our life, even if times are difficult. If we undergo persecution or we have illness, it doesn't mean God has quit being merciful or uh, that he's quit being kind uh, or loving. Uh, even when there's affliction, uh, and in particular when he's afflicting us because he's disciplining us, that doesn't vacate his mercy. It's, a, it's an expression of his mercy. It's an expression of his love for us. And Hebrews uh, uh, 12 tells us that in the latter part of that chapter, that like a, a father, paraphrase here, lovingly disciplines his children, so God disciplines us. And, and so we have that here. I would even continue to verse 16, saying, Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. And during that affliction is when we see his yeah. hand move the most. 
And as long as your eyes are open, that's what it's there for. And you can see it even more so when we're going through those hard times. Yeah, and I think you can even make an application back to, to Bill's question is uh, in Deuteronomy 6. Uh, Moses puts down what God had called the Israelites to, to begin to teach their children young about who God is. And when you're by the, the doorpost and when you're on the path and, and so forth, that uh, you, you teach them early uh, and, and you give them the opportunity to learn early about uh, the mercies of God and the character of God. And not just that God is good, God is good. And not just that God is love, God is love, but that God is also just and that, that God is also uh, righteous. So I think there's, a, there's a, a lot of good application there. All right, what things does Moses request of God? We've talked about some of them as we've gone along here, but what, what kinds of things has he requested of God? And have these needs changed today? <clears throat> well, let's talk about a couple of things that he's requested. I know our time is getting short, but we still got about... 10 minutes, let's, uh, let's hit a couple of them and then talk about why or why it's not the same today. Well, I had everything, we talked about everything, but I had 17 as well. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Let's establish the work of our hands. And that's really neat because we're asking God not to, not to basically confirm what we want to do, but to guide us in the work that he wants us to do. Hey, good. Yeah, because everything we do, what are we supposed to do? Again, this is, a, this is an Old Testament expression of a New Testament truth. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Uh, and, and that's essentially what Moses is asking here. Establish the work, work of our hands. Be involved in the work of our hands. And that's, again, we, we can see that from God's perspective. God wants to be involved in the work of our hands because he has build us. We are in this, this side of the cross where the temples of the Holy Spirit, but then we also have to have a willingness to do all to the glory of God and ask God to establish the work of our hands, that, our, that the work of our hands is going, to be, is going to be righteous, that we're not doing unrighteous things uh, with our hands. So very good, very good observation. Another one, what, what else does he request? Okay. Wow. <laughs> and that's a big one. Uh, you know, judge us not according to our iniquity. And for us, we have the benefit of knowing that our sins have been placed on Jesus Christ. He bore our sins. They looked forward to that. But even at this point, there's a, a, a very shadowy nature to it. You know, Hebrews talks about they looked at shadows of the things to come. It becomes, again, a progressive revelation. It becomes more well-defined as you go through the prophets. But at this time, understanding that God was going to take their sins, um, you know, they still had a much more visual understanding of that, that uh, and even a rudimentary understanding because they just got the law. You know, this is the first generation of the law. And so seeing those sacrifices go and reading about the sacrifices and understanding and learning the law is still new to them. They're on the training grounds of what really begins to point uh, like a big giant red arrow forward to Jesus Christ. Uh, so that, especially for the new generation to practice the law and practice the sacrifices, it's a big statement because those sacrifices are a reminder that God does not judge them according to their iniquities when they come in faith, that God is laying those sins on something else. For them, they see it as this lamb, or they see it as, as the sacrifice, but it's pointing forward to the provision that God makes, uh, ultimately through Jesus Christ. Awesome. Anyone else? We could go on and on. Have compassion on the people, you know, calling out for compassion. Uh, make us glad. Uh, let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. So why have some, I already asked the question, have these changed today? Somebody already said no. And that's the right answer. They haven't changed today. Why haven't they changed today? What are the similarities between us today and uh, the people 
and Moses himself as he writes here in Psalm 90 and in these other pre-Davidic Psalms? It's not a trick question. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, when I see that back in the day, back in the day, back in the day, they had to have, as Romans for the king, they had to have the sacrifice to determine them. They Christ is the atonement. Okay. Good. And when you repent of your sins, that Christ bore our sins on the cross, and therefore as as God's children. Okay. Good. Yeah. The, the biggest similarity is that, is that the needs of man haven't changed. Uh, they, they were sinful. They had need for repent redemption. Uh, and God provided our we, we still have need for redemption. God has provided it in Jesus Christ. So there, there are similarities. And, and, and so in a general sense for, all sinful man, that's the case. Now you bring it into the realm of the redeemed or the faithful. There were faithful Jews at that time. Moses obviously was faithful. Moses is calling out for these things. Uh, so for us today, should we still call out for God to have compassion and, and make us glad? And Well, sure, because the needs of even the redeemed haven't changed. They're the same. We have a fuller vision of what Christ did than what they had. They had the symbols of the things that were to come. We have the fullness of it. Um, if anything, it ought to give us the capacity to have even a greater faith, knowing that God fulfilled all those things that he gave to them in the person of Christ. Uh, and we get to look back and see that. Now we ought to have even a greater faith that we have access to those things and that everything that's left to be done, God is going to fulfill just as surely as he fulfilled those things then. So, uh, and we could, we could name a whole bunch of other things. Um, for me, it's, you know, especially if Moses wrote this, wrote this in the, the midst of the wandering or at the beginning of the wandering, uh, are we wanderers? Uh, we, we are still. I mean, we're strangers and aliens in a foreign land. Uh, you know, the old hymn, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. We get really, we really want to put roots down and get attached to this world. And as Christians, we're really not supposed to. And that doesn't mean we can't be Americans and all that stuff. You know, that's, that's fine, but keep in perspective, because this is just temporary. Uh, we've got someplace else to go, uh, and, and our allegiance belongs there. So we have that similarity with this, this group of folks as well. Okay, anyone else? Uh, any uh, practical applications or questions? Uh, that you came across that just uh, that didn't make sense, and you, you know, or just an observation you wanted to make in Psalm 90. One of the things that stood out to me was verse 14. Um, it says, that satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we can be rejoiced and be glad. Um, I think that in response, in relation to uh, the world, that are constantly looking for satisfaction and joy and we have this great privilege of having it at our fingertips all the time, um, but we often don't grab it. Uh, we would prefer to try to do everything like the world does and try to grasp it ourselves, but it's right there if we went the right way. Okay. And I see that so many times in so many different ways, but that one really stood out to me, that, especially the satisfaction. Right? I, and I think that's, that's a really good observation, and it's, it's one of those that I'd encourage you to, to – uh, chew on that. Both uh, Bill and Andy both brought up that verse. And there are a couple words in there that I think are worth revisiting, uh, and we won't do it in here. I'll just encourage you to do it, and that's satisfaction and glad, gladness. Because we have, unfortunately, a very superficial understanding of what satisfaction and gladness mean. Uh, you know, he gets put, pushed back from the table and say, oh, this meal good? Oh, yeah, I'm satisfied. Uh, it, it has a deeper meaning than that. And gladness has a deeper meaning than I was listening, I told you all, I've been listening to Jay Vernon McGee, my mom, my, my, my wife got me back on him, and he just cracks me up. Uh, it's just so just simplistic, you know, and I think I was listening to the Ecclesiastes this week, and so everybody wants to be happy, and I don't think God necessarily wants us to be happy. 
and it's the same here. We think of glad, and God wants us to be glad, walking around with a smile on our face all the time. Be glad and be ecstatic. That's not what he's talking about. It, it has more to do with contentment, particularly in our relationship with God. And, uh, you know, Paul reviews his kind of short biography of beatings and afflictions and being stoned and shipwrecked and left for dead. That doesn't sound like cause to be glad, but he was. He, he still had joy. He could still say confidently, rejoice in the Lord always. So very good. All right. Well, we're at our time, so I'll stick around. Anybody, you're welcome to stick around, talk some more if you want, or ask questions or make comments. Uh, but we'll pray so that if anybody needs to, to be on their way, they can do that. Uh, and next week, I'll try not to talk so much in preparation. We'll get <laughs> more to the heart of the, the text instead. Heavenly Father, we come thanking you for your word, thanking you for preserving it for us, thanking you for the, the testimony of Moses. And Lord, uh, what, what a powerful testimony it is. And it, it just reminds us that there's no time in our life that's off limits to you if we are willing to be used that you might call us and you might use us in very remarkable ways and even in, in ways that might seem small to us at the time we may find out in eternity that we, they were really uh, remarkable ways so as Moses said we echo tonight uh, teach us to number our days and to yield those days to you that you might use us for your purposes for your glory for your honor I pray that you go with each one as they uh, go home and, and through the activities of the week, Lord, that uh, our hearts would be set on glorifying you and that you'd bring us back uh, together again according to your will uh, uh, tomorrow or Sunday or whenever each one can be here. We thank you for your love, for your great grace in Christ's name. Amen. All right, remember to pick up next week's study there at the door if you didn't get it. You can also get those online if, if you'd like. Thank you all for coming tonight. Have some more to eat because I don't want to carry anything back upstairs.